do you pray for people like their life depended on it? We're going to find out today in 1 John chapter 5 that that's exactly how we should pray for folks, particularly for those who are fellow believers in Jesus Christ. One of the things that will hinder us in our fellowship is prayerlessness, prayerlessness. What do you do when you see a believer committing a sin? Do you gossip about it? Tell somebody else about it? Do you gloat over evidence of the fact that they're really no good? I knew they weren't going to be true. I knew they weren't going to follow. They might not even be saved. Or do you pray to God for them? Not necessarily in a group, but individually. Do you pray for them? Because everybody tends to fall into sin from time to time. And sin disrupts fellowship not only with God, but with one another. And so God wants to have fellowship with us. He wants us to experience His joy. And if we're going to experience joy, we're going to have to deal with sin even in other believers. Look in John chapter 5. It's on page 1034 in the Pew Bible. You can follow along there. But the previous section, what we dealt with last week, ended with these words. Whoever has the Son has life. And whoever does not have the Son, God's Son, does not have life. What we're reading about today and what we're going to be studying in verses 13 through 17 is how to help other believers. Let's pray. Father, we ask now as we come to your word that you will lead and guide us to understand it. And Lord, to know how to apply it in our lives. Father, we thank you so much that you brought us into fellowship with you. Through the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, you paid the penalty for our sins. Through the saving power of the Holy Spirit, you've saved us when we believe. We know we're your children. And Father, we want to live as your children. But Lord, we are sinful. We have a sin nature. But Father, there's so much about us in the way we think that sometimes it gets in the way of understanding what you're trying to say. And so, Lord, this morning, I want to ask that your Holy Spirit will open our hearts and our minds. That, Father, we might know what you're saying. And, Lord, that you might put it in our hearts to do that. Father, we thank you for this study in 1 John. Lord, it's been difficult. It's been challenging. It's been confronting many things about our lives that we need to change, things we need to do. And Father, we pray this morning that you'll make us people that pray, pray for one another. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. You follow along as I read. 1 John chapter 5, verse 12. Whoever has the Son has life. That's, we could stop right there. If you've got the Son of God, you've got life. But he says it the other way, whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. So you're either saved or not. Either you have eternal life or you don't. It's possible to know that. Verse 13, I have written that like this to you, I've written this to you, who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Great, he wants us to know that. And we are confident that he hears us whenever we ask for anything that pleases him. And since we know he hears us when we make our request, we also know that he will give us what we ask for. That's good common sense. But what are we going to ask for? Verse 16. If you see a fellow believer sinning in a way that does not lead to death, you should pray, and God will give that person life. But there is a sin that leads to death, and I'm not saying you should pray for those who commit it. All wicked actions are sin, but not every sin leads to death. Now, if you're wondering where the tough passage was, that was it right there. There's it right there. So we're going to take some time to deal with that hopefully this morning. Number one, he wants us to know that we have eternal life. This is Christian truth. It's for Christians. If you're not a believer, if you've not put your trust in Jesus Christ, if you've not been born again, if you don't have the Spirit of God dwelling within you, if that has not happened to you, you can listen in. This is not going to make a lot of sense to you. But if you are a believer, we're talking about believers, those who are Christians, who are doing the praying. We're also talking about believers who are doing the sinning. Wait a minute. I thought believers weren't supposed to sin. That's right. But believers do sin. Remember he dealt with that back in chapter 1? If we say we have no sin, well, we're calling God a liar. What we're supposed to do is to confess our sins. And if we confess our sins, which says, God, I've done this, and I realize it's sin, and there's not a thing I can do about it. Because it says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's a faith statement. You get saved by faith, and we live the Christian life by faith. Basically, that is saying, God, you know, there's not a thing in the world I can do to pay for my sin. 
I can't do anything to pay for my sin. I might be able to try to do something to make reparations. I might be able to do something to try to change what I've done to somebody and try to make up for it. I might could do some things like that, but I really can't deal with the guilt I had before you. I can't deal with the consequences of sin before you. I'm just not able to do that. I need you to do something for me. I need you to take care of it. So when we confess it, we're saying we're helpless. God, we're dependent upon you. And God says, good, I got it. I'll take care of it. That's the sin. Now, there are some churches that teach you can't know that you have eternal life. In fact, they believe that you won't know for certain until you're in heaven, when and if you finally get there. Then and only then will you know. I think that's a false doctrine because it contradicts what John says here. He says you can know that you have eternal life. Either you're living eternal life now or you're going to get eternal life when you get to heaven, but both can't be true. Are you living an eternal life now? Do you have God's life? When we're talking about eternal life, remember we said <clears throat> it's not so much that it's going to go on and on forever. I don't want eternal life now. And that's what it means. If you just keep going on and on and on and you never die, that's not eternal life. That's misery. I'm not looking forward to getting old in about 20 years or 30 years. My dad waited till 30 years older than I am to get old, and I think that's a good time to get old. Uh, it, maybe when you hit somewhere in your mid-90s, that'd be a good time to get old. But, I mean, it, it's not pleasant to look forward to. Getting old is not for sissies. I didn't hear a single amen. I'm going to say it one more time. <laughs> Getting old is not for sissies. Amen. Yeah, I, I hear that. That's a lot of older voices speaking that, but it's true. That's not eternal life. Eternal life is God shares with you his life now. He implants his life in you. You are now born again, and you are in relationship with God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit with all the apostles, with all the saints who've gone before, and with all the saints here at Bible Center and saints in the community. You're in fellowship with them. Missionaries we've prayed for, we're in fellowship with them because we've all been saved. We've all put our trust in Christ and we're relying upon Him. And we have that in common together. He says, I want you to know that you have eternal life. I have written this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. How do you get eternal life? Well, you've got to live right. You've got to be good. You've got to confess your sins. You've got to go to church. You've got to tithe. Not, what's it say? Who believe in the name of the Son of God. You realize that all you've got to do to be saved is to believe. That's all you can do. You can't go to the cross and pay for your own sins. Make things right between you and God. And God says, okay, since you've done that, I'll give you eternal life. No, he did it. And our faith is a faith that's based on believing, trusting, relying upon what Jesus did as the only way of salvation. That's how we all got in. Didn't anybody get in because they're good? Didn't anybody get in because they're smart or because they're rich? We got in the same way. You have to come in by faith. I believe Jesus Christ simply and solely because I believed in the name of the Son of God. By the way, his name stands for who he is and what he is. So when I believe in the name, I'm saying I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah, however else you want to agitive that or add on to that. But the one that we're talking about, the one John's been talking about, the one that he saw and walked with and touched and knew, he said that's the one who died on the cross to pay for our sins, and I put my trust in him. And that simple transaction is all that God requires to be saved. When that happens, you gain eternal life. God's spirit comes to live inside of you, and you have eternal life from that moment on. And that's the only way anybody gets it. One advantage of knowing you have eternal life through Jesus Christ is you have confidence in prayer. Look at verse 14. And we are confident. Why? Because we are God's children. We are confident that he hears us whenever we ask for anything that pleases him. And since we know he hears us when we make our request, we also know that he will give us what we ask for. There's a confidence we have of going to God in prayer. Not just that prayers don't just bounce off the ceiling, but that when God hears us pray, God says, I will do that. I'm, God is going to do what you ask with, let's put one caveat in there, because he does. If we ask for anything that pleases him, in other words, if we ask for anything, it literally says that is in or according to his will, what God wants done. If you ask God to do something God wants to do, God always does it. It's like asking me, would you like a piece of pumpkin pie? Yeah, I'm, I'm inclined to. Now, if you ask me, do you want beets? Yeah, okay, I, I could eat them maybe. 
Now, God's will is only what is good and perfect and accomplishes holiness. If I ask for what God wants, which is the right thing, the good thing, God says, I'm going to do that because you're finally asking for what pleases me. Now, why did I mention that? Well, because there are people that, and I'm not going to name names, a lot of them are on TV and on the radio, and they say, you know, you can ask for anything. You name it and claim it, that's yours. All you got to do is say that. Whatever you want. You can speak your reality into existence just by saying whatever you want. And the caveat here is it better be what God wants because that's what God is going to give. God is going to give it what he wants. I think one of the main errors of name it, claim it, the idea that, you know, God wants you to be prosperous and wealthy is Jesus Christ who died wealthy and the Apostle Paul who, of course, was extremely wealthy all of his life and the Apostle Peter who lived in a big mansion. Remember what Peter and John said as they went up to the temple? Silver and gold have I none, none. Anybody... I don't, I don't, I'm not, I probably shouldn't ask. I'm going to ask this. Don't raise your hand. Anybody, anybody here not got money in your pocket? And I'll count cards because that's money nowadays. I mean, can you imagine one of the founding members, one of the 12 apostles of the Lamb of God being so weak in his faith that he didn't have a lot of silver and gold coins with him? That he wasn't maxed out wealthy? What were they doing walking to the temple? Why wouldn't somebody carry him in the temple? You see, if Christ is the example who said foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has not a place to lay his head. I don't even own a home, Jesus said. Then what business do you have having a home or a mansion? Or, you know, I really don't like my car. i got to have a snazzier. And God has to get it from me because I've asked him for it. God says, no. You can have confidence if you ask for what God wants, you'll get it. God will do what you're asking because you're asking according to his will. James 4, 3 talks about one of the reasons we don't get stuff like that. Because we cannot ask God for anything. It's because we ask it in order that we might enjoy it on our pleasures. You see, we're not God-focused, we're me-focused. And that's a great error of that approach. Instead, the work of prayer is not in formulating the words and trying to say it in a flowery language. That's not it at all. The work of prayer is figuring out what is it that God wants. What is God's will? Now, some of it's pretty easy. For instance, you, we've actually got verses in the Bible that says the will of God is your sanctification. God wants you to be holy. You can always ask God, make me holy, and God says, I'm, I'm glad to give you that. I'm, I'm doing that. Yep, keep on. Keep on asking. You can ask that every day. You can ask that every moment of the day. God says, it pleases me to make you holy. It's pleasing to me to do that for you. It's pleasing to me, God says, to make you like my son, Jesus Christ. That's what I want to do. But some things, it's a little tougher to try to figure out, God, what do you want? What's your will in this situation? I've said this often before. You're not going to get out of this world alive. You're going to get sick. And most of the time, you're going to recover, praise the Lord. But there's coming one that's not going to be God's will for you to recover from. Now, should we pray for God to heal you? Well, we probably will. But we also recognize it may not always be God's will to heal this. Paul said, I prayed three times for God to take away a thorn from my flesh, and he didn't. Talking about some sort of physical infirmity. But God said the third time, he said, I've told you three times, no. He didn't say it exactly that way, but that's what he said. But he said, my grace is sufficient for you. See, we've got to figure out what is it God wants. God does not always want what I want. God wants better for me than what I want. I want a life of ease, don't you? I'd like to be, I'd like to have money to give away. You know, I've got not money to burn, but money to use and money to give away. This would be all a great thing. Man, have all kinds of money floating around. This is wonderful. It may not be God's will. God may say, I'll give you enough. I'll give you what you need. But what I want you to start focusing on is praying for what God wants. Figure out what it is God wants. Study the Bible until you know what God wants in a situation. Say, God, this is what I'm going to ask for. I'm believing you for this because you say you want to do this. I believe this is what you want to do. And I have no problem with anybody who says, I believe God wants this and I'm going to ask you for it. Go right ahead. I know also that God is such a loving Heavenly Father. If you ask Him for a piece of bread, He's not going to give you a stone. If you say, I need a spoon to eat with, He's not going to give you a snake, an asp, a uh, water moccasin to use our situation. 
No. God is going to give you what's good if you're asking according to his will. And I think we always should pray according to your will. Father, we want your will. After all, isn't that what Jesus did? He got down on his knees in the garden. He said, I pray, Father, if you will, let this cup pass from me. Jesus, in his humanity, he was fully human, did not want to die, particularly the kind of death he knew he was going to die. He said, I pray, Father, you let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. You see, Jesus wanted God's will more than he wanted his own human will. Now, when we get to that point, we're about ready to start praying seriously because there are people that are lost we need to pray for. There are also believers who are sinning, verse 16. If you see a fellow believer sinning in a way that does not lead to death, you should pray that God will give that person life For there is a sin that leads to death. And I'm not saying you should pray for those who commit it. Now what in the world is he talking about? Well, I don't think he's talking about the unpardonable sin, which is rejecting the testimony of the Spirit of God to Jesus. That's a sin that an unbeliever commits. A believer doesn't commit that sin. There are sins that lead to death. There are sins in the Old Testament. And as you study this week, For your Sunday school lesson, sometime after Christmas you'll be studying your Sunday school. I've given you a bunch of examples of things to look at in the Old Testament that lead to death. They're capital punishment situations. Even the Apostle Paul said, if I've committed a sin worthy of death, I don't mind dying. But he's not talking about a capital punishment situation, something where the person is going to die because of this. For instance, you remember Ananias and Sapphira? They were Christians. They were believers who decided to get some glory. They want it to get up and they want it to publicly give the money from a field they sold. But they also wanted the money as well or some of it. And so they gave some of the money and kept some back but they said we're given all the money. We've sold our field and we've gotten all the money. We want to get the same kind of praise that Barnabas got because he sold a field on Cyprus and gave all the money and man he was great. They even gave him a nickname. They went from Joseph to Barnabas, son of encouragement. Man, He's high up there. He's got access to the apostles. We want that. So they connived together to do that. Well, Ananias came in and he told the lie. And Peter said, uh, why were you not afraid to lie to the Holy Spirit and tell this lie like the Holy Spirit doesn't know what you're doing and isn't communicating it to us? And he said, because of this, you're going to die. And he fell down dead and the men carried him out. Several hours later, his wife came in. They asked her, let's see if she's in on it. Give her a chance to say, no, we we didn't do it. No, did you sell the land for this amount and give that money? She said, yes, we did. Peter said, the guys, they just got back. The guys that buried your husband have just walked in the door, and she fell down and died and took her out. That's a death penalty case. He said, well, all they did was lie. Yeah, sometimes when you lie, the penalty is death. Apostle Paul writing in 1 Corinthians 11 talking about things that happen at the Lord's table. He said, that is why many of you are weak and sick and some have even died. God said, no, there's no mercy for that. Because of what you've done, you're falling into sickness and some of you are going to die because of that. He said, don't bother praying for that. I've already decided this person's going to die because of what they've done. I've already pronounced that sin, deserves this punishment. No need to bother and pray. Peter And the apostles, they didn't pray. God spare Ananias and Sapphira. They said, let's deal with it. Let God take care of it. God took care of some of the violations in 1 Corinthians 11 at the the Lord's table. Uh, He dealt with that at that point. What's he saying? There are sins that we commit that can lead to death but do not require the death penalty. If you see a sin that does not lead to death, you ought to pray and God, ask God to give that person life. Now, two things in that regard. There's several sins you can commit that won't kill you right now. Let's talk about a non-death penalty sin that will touch just about everybody here. <clears throat> speeding. Now, I would not want to live in a society where if they caught you speeding, they sent you to the electric chair. I think I would give up my license. But a person who habitually speeds may encounter a telephone pole or a tree, and all of a sudden, you've died because of what you've done. If you do this, eventually, you could wind up dying. We ought to pray for people that we see involved in that kind of sin or that kind of thing. That's an example of that. There are some sins you can commit that are not, the Bible does not speak about death penalty for them. It's not a capital punishment thing. But there are sins that if you keep going this direction, you're going to die. 
and you may die earlier than you should. I think we ought to pray for people that we see committing that kind of sin, and we ought to pray that God would give them life, that God would bring them to the place of repentance where they'd say, I don't want to do that. I'm, we're talking about Christians. We're not talking about unsaved people. We're talking about Christians that are involved in a sin. That's one possibility. And I think we ought to be praying for them. There are people who are involved in, in uh, taking drugs. And sooner or later, that's going to shorten their life. They're doing risky things. They're, they're involved in things that are bad. Uh, I would say there are people that overeat, but that gets a little too close to home. January. We'll start, pray the Lord will deal with that in January. But, you know, if you, if you keep carrying all of the weight, I know this is not good. You know, and so if you keep on, I know this is not a good thing to do. I ought to pray about this. But there's another aspect of this that I want us to consider when he says, ask God to give them life. When we sin, we stop walking in the light. Remember, you can't say I'm in the light and sin at the same time. I'm not walking in the light if I'm walking in sin. When I see a brother or sister in Christ that's not walking in the light, when they're involved in sin, they're committing a sin. We know it's a sin. We know they're doing it. I know immediately they're not walking in the light because they've left God in the light and they started to walk in the darkness. They've left the God who is light and life and they're now walking the path of death and darkness. There are a lot of people who get wrapped up in sin and miss out on eternal life, living it now. I'm not saying they lose their salvation, but they stop enjoying the joy of fellowship with God. You know people in your family, you know friends, have stopped walking with the Lord, and they're not experiencing the joy of knowing God and being in fellowship with Him. They've not experienced the joy of being transformed by the encounter with the Word of God that we've had here. First John's been tough, because every week we decide to deal with a different detour that takes us off on the path of darkness and death, and some of them hit home, for me anyway. It's been tough. I'm glad to see First John one more Sunday, and we're First John out of the way. No, First John, stay with us because we've got to deal with those things. Why? Because we want to live. That eternal life we're given, we want to live it now. I don't want to wait till I'm dead to get eternal life and say, boy, I could have enjoyed all of this before. Instead, I chose to walk in a path of sin. I chose to go do this sin. I chose to engage in this. I chose to hang on to this. I chose to hate my brother. I chose to do these things. I don't want to do that. I don't want you to do that. I want to pray that you have life. When we see somebody that's wrapped up in sin, they're not enjoying life because they can't. They may be driving a sports car. They're not enjoying the good things of God. I need to pray that God will give them life because they're missing it. Child of God, do you realize that when you're in sin, even if nobody else knows about it, God does, and you've cut yourself off from his life, and you're just living an ordinary human life. We need to pray, pray that God will give that person life. Pray as if their life depends upon it. Let me suggest one other reason from 1 John as to why you should pray. Let's say we don't pray for one another, and we don't pray about this matter of sin. Pretty soon this one drops out of life, and this one drops out of life, and this one drops out of life. You remember how you can love God, the only way you can love God? You can't love God whom you haven't seen unless you're expressing that love to a brother or sister in Christ that you have seen. Well, if we all get off in sin and we all get wrapped up in sin, who's there to love? How are we going to love God if we're the only Christian left or we think we're the only Christian left? You see, it's absolutely vital for us to be in fellowship with one another in order to show God our love, in order to experience the love of God, in, ex in order to enjoy that joy of walking in fellowship. Part of it is, yeah, I'm in fellowship with God, but part of it is being in fellowship with you folks. If we don't do that, then all of a sudden we kind of slowly die. And we say we love God, but God says, well, show me. How are you going to show me? And so we turn out to be the liars when we're saying, I love God if I'm not praying for my brother and sisters in Christ that are in sin. Now, is that all we do? Well, no, there's, that's a whole other lesson. But we ought to start with praying about that sin, that God would grant this person life. Now, what's God going to do? God's going to bring them to repentance. God's going to bring them to the place where they confess that sin. I don't want to live that way. I don't want to be in a blue funk. I want to be happy. I want to have the joy of the Lord, and I'm tired of this sin. We pray, God, bring them to that point. God, show them that this is wrong. Maybe they don't know it's sin. God may use you to say, look, I see you doing this, and this is not right. But first, we ought to pray. Now, I don't know if you've ever tried to change somebody's mind that's bullheaded and pigheaded. Don't point. You can't do it, but God can. Why do we pray? Because if God doesn't work, it doesn't. 
happen. God has to do the work. What about the lost? You ever try to talk to somebody that's blind and deaf? You're trying to convince people that don't look at the world. They think you're a threat because you're a Christian. They don't realize that you're the only thing standing between them and hell. A life of separation with God for all eternity. They're, they're experiencing that now. They just haven't hit the eternal part of it. And they can't see it. And when you tell them the gospel, it just goes one ear and out the other because there's nothing in there to stop it. There's no filter in there to stop it. It just bounces off. Only the Holy Spirit of God can bring a person to conviction. John chapter 16, verses 11, 12, 13. Talk about that. Looked at that last week. When Jesus left, he sent the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will do the work of convicting people of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. Of sin, we're sinners. Christ is righteous. If I want... To be righteous, I've got to be like Christ. I've got to receive Christ as my Savior. I've got to put my trust in him because he's the one that made things right. And judgment because time will run out. Christ is coming back, and I need to be in fellowship with him before he comes. I need to know him as Savior, but only the Spirit of God can do that work. Why do we pray? Because if God doesn't do it, my witnessing is not going to do it. Now, God won't do it without my witness. But if I witness and God doesn't work, it's not going to happen. We pray that God will do the work. God wants to save people. I can pray because I know that's his will. God wants to convert Christians from their life of sin to walking in fellowship with him. I can pray for that because that's what God wants. That's his will. I can pray for that. And I can have confidence I'm asking what God wants. And what God wants, God gets. Father, we come to you in prayer. Praying for family and friends, Lord, who have made professions of faith but who are not walking with you. And Lord, we see the death spreading over their life, Lord, almost on a daily basis. And Father, we would ask that you might turn them from their sinful ways, might convict them that they're doing the wrong thing, that they might put their trust in you again, start walking with you. Father, we pray also for many friends and neighbors around us who enjoy Christmas but don't follow Christ. They've yet to put their trust in Christ. Lord, they just don't understand the words and what they mean. I pray, Father, that you'll open their heart and mind even this Christmas. Maybe there'll be a song sung. Maybe there'll be something said that will stir their thinking that they need to know you. They need to walk with you each day of their life. And, Father, that you'll transform their whole world, that they will this Christmas season pass from death to life eternal. And Father, we know that's your will. Father, we pray that you'll use us to pray for them, that you might give us the privilege of being involved in that work you're doing. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.